Are you all ready for the holiday season? Who's ready for the holiday season? Man, I thought about just getting up here and starting the service this morning with this song. It's the most wonderful time. Uh, no, I'm not. I did start the service like that. I decided to go with it. But you may not realize it or not, but Friday is November the 1st. And November the 1st, nowadays, is the official start to the holiday season. I mean, you're going to walk into Walmart and Lowe's and every store that you go to, and you're going to hear Christmas music, and you're going to start seeing Christmas commercials. And so I kind of am just interested this morning, where are my people that are going to start decorating for Christmas already this weekend? I mean, you already got plans. Wow, quite a bit of you. How many of you have already started? Did anybody in here start already? Oh my goodness, I knew there would be at least one. It's always that outlier. All right, but where are my traditionalists? Okay, where are the people that are like, we do not start Christmas until Thanksgiving is over. Where are you at right there? Wow, the overwhelming majority of people in here today. Well, you all are going to be happy and you all are going to be excited because as a church, we are not going to skip over Thanksgiving. I'm excited about our new sermon series that we're getting started today. It's called... Thanks living. And it is a journey from faithless to faithful. And we're going to be looking at this through the book of Malachi. And we're going to spend the next five Sundays actually talking about this because I believe with all my heart that God's not simply interested in just a day of thanksgiving, but in a life of thanks living. A life that is filled with faith and trust in him where thankfulness overflows into every single area and aspect of our lives. And I got another question for you. Has God been good to you today? Let me ask you that again. Has God been good to you today? All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about something that you're thankful for. All right, shouldn't take that long. There should be things that just pop. The first thing that pops in your mind, something that you're thankful for. Now I want you to tell somebody near you what that is. All right, so take a minute, tell somebody something that you're thankful for. <clears throat> all right, this is great. I love this part. That's why I do this so often. I like when you all talk to each other. I like hearing the laughing and seeing the interaction and the different things going on. The reality is that God has been good to every single one of us here today. But I want to ask that question one more time. I want to ask it like this in a more serious and somber tone. Has he really been good to you? Now, there's a lot of people that are shaking their heads, but I have no doubt in a crowd this size on a morning like today, there's probably more than just one or two. There's probably several people in here that are probably struggling with that question right now. You, you know it in your head, but you're not necessarily feeling that in your heart. And I liked what that video pointed out, that, that video that we just watched a little bit ago, talked about the fact that life has a way of breaking grateful hearts. You know, sometimes we go through pain and we go through struggle and we go through loss and we experience unmet expectations. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever been at a point in your life where you doubted God's goodness and, and maybe you went before him and you said, God, I, I know that you're good, but I'm not seeing any evidence of it in my life. The reality is that life has a way of beating up our grateful hearts. And even though it's easy sometimes to sit here and say, has God been good? And we can shout amen. That doesn't necessarily mean that we get up every day and we feel thankfulness and we feel God's love and we feel God's goodness. And this is exactly where we find ourselves in the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book written in the Old Testament, okay? And I, I like how this leads into, we're going to spend all the time at the end of the Old Testament, and then we're going to go right into Christmas season and right into the greatest story that's ever been told. God becomes man, and he comes to this earth to go to a cross. And I love how all of that, that is going to flow into um, the next few months. But Malachi, being the last book of the Old Testament, it's written after about a thousand years of history between God and the nation of Israel. How many of you agree that a thousand years of history, there's a whole lot of context in a book like the book of Malachi. And what's interesting about this book is that the glory days of the nation of Israel were long dead and gone. And to God's people, it seemed as if he had forgotten them. It seemed as if he did not love them. And you want to talk about some unmet expectations Life was only a shell of what it was supposed to be. I mean, the nation of Israel was poor. 
It was dominated and ruled by foreign powers. I mean, the temple had been rebuilt. Yes, they had, they had experienced devastating loss. The city of Jerusalem had been destroyed. The people of Israel were taken in, into captivity. But God restored them. He led them back to the nation of Israel. They rebuilt the walls. They rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the temple. But when they rebuilt it, guess what? Nothing phenomenal happened. When Solomon's temple was dedicated, I mean, a cloud came down and the glory of the Lord filled the temple and the people were waiting for something like that. And there was no dramatic signs that God had returned to dwell in the midst of his people. And so there, there was no visible evidence of, of God's presence anywhere around them. Hey, there were no prophets like Elisha and Elijah performing miracles to the children of Israel. It seemed like they were forgotten. And it seemed as if God had abandoned them. And as a result, God's people lost their hope in him, and they had become faithless. In this book, man, there's so many applications to where we're at in, in our lives today. I, I love this book. I think it's going to be very helpful for us. Their lives were filled with financial insecurity. Their lives were filled with plenty of personal disappointments. Their lives were filled with religious skepticism. I mean, they're just, again, they're questioning God and everything about what they had heard and what they had known in their mind. Have any of you ever been there before? Any of you have any financial insecurities today? I could probably get a big, loud amen from that one right there. Yeah, I got two hands up in the back, man. Some people are like, yes. I mean, we know what that's like. Have you ever had personal disappointments in your life? You ever just wake up sometimes and just feel like life is a shell of what you thought it was going to be and, and what it was supposed to be? We've all been here before. Have you ever doubted and questioned God? Yes, I'm sure, again, a lot of us have. Well, here is the title of the message this morning. Here's the good news, all right? Are you ready for this? Smile, God loves you. Everybody do that right now. Just put a big smile on your face. Come on, some of you, some of you that are tired and grouchy, go ahead, put a big smile on your face. God loves you. The very first message that God has for his faithless people, for those who are questioning him and doubting him, he shows up and right off the bat, we're gonna dive right into this. He says, I have loved you. God loves you. God loves me. He loves us deeply and personally. And a life of thanksgiving, a life of thanks living begins with knowing and responding to God's love. And so that's what we're gonna be looking at this morning. So you're all ready to dive right in. Who's ready to go? I'm not convinced. All right, I'm gonna start over at the beginning. Who's ready to dive right in? Here we go, okay. First point that I want us to see this morning is God has loved you. God has loved you. I have a real, I'll give you the spoiler. I have a real simple outline today. The outline is this. God has loved you. God does love you. God will love you. Okay. There will never be, and there has never been a single moment in your life where you have not been loved by God. So smile. God has loved you. Look at verse one. Let's just dive right in. Here it says in verse one. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The only thing that we know about the prophet Malachi is what his name means. And his name means my messenger. We don't know anything about his family background. We don't know what he did for a living. So we're not even going to talk about anything else except for the fact that his job was to be a messenger of the Lord. And in this verse, there's a very interesting word. It says at the beginning, it says, the burden of the word of the Lord. His job was to deliver the burden of the word of the Lord to the nation of Israel. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Is God's word a burden? And the answer is yes, it is. It's a burden for many different reasons. I'll give you a couple of them. One of the reasons why God's word is a burden is because it is never light or trivial. There is nothing in this book that is frivolous. There is nothing in God's word that is light or trivial. It is weighty. It is serious. It is heavy. Even the milk of the word, okay, the basics of God's word. It's meaty. It's enough to have a profound impact on your life and to change your life, okay? So the burden of the word of the Lord, it is heavy. It is weighty. It is serious. You know why else the word of the Lord is a burden? It demands a response, 
You can't hear the word that comes from the Lord and just pretend like you haven't heard it and let it go in one ear and out the other and just continue to go on living your life the same way. No, once you hear the word of the Lord, it demands a response. And if you choose to ignore it, you're no longer guiltless. You are doing it deliberately and blatantly against God. Hey, the word of the Lord is a burden because it demands a response in our lives and it requires our full attention and our full devotion. Hey, the word of the Lord is a burden because it can be met with opposition. Now, how many of you believe that the word of the Lord is good news? I mean, has God's word changed your life? I mean, we're talking about it's weighty, it's serious, it's substantial. Well, when you let that stuff start sinking in and it starts profoundly changing your life, all of a sudden you realize how good and awesome God's word is. And you know what the natural result should be? You want others to experience that as well. Hey, one of the things I love about when someone first gets saved, almost instantly, you know, a couple weeks in, maybe a month or two in, they start getting burdened about their family. And I've had people come to me even just recently, hey, how can I share the gospel with my family? I want them to know, I want them to experience and have the same exact thing that I have. And you know what it starts to do? It starts to be a burden inside of you. And you know why it's a burden? Because even though it's good news, it can still be rejected by so many. God help us that we're not people who reject his word. So the burden of the word of the Lord, here's Malachi's burden. God's answering several questions that the children of Israel, the charges that they've thrown at him all throughout this book. And Malachi's burden begins right here in verse 2. He just comes right out of the gate And he's just not holding anything back. And look what he says. You all help me with those first four words. What does it say right there in verse two? Out loud together. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Man, that's pretty powerful. I I can tell my wife, I have loved you. And that's powerful words in our relationship. But that's nothing compared to the fact that when God shows up and says, I have loved you, saith the Lord. That means something. That's powerful. The reason why Malachi has to take the time to say this is because these people are questioning God's love. Look at what it says in verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? They're, They're cynical. They're skeptical about God's love. Because of their unmet expectations, they're just sitting there wondering, well, God can't possibly be good because I expect all of these blessings and I expect all of these good things. And where are they? And because they're not here and because my life's not going the way that I thought it should go, obviously you don't love me. Wherein hast thou said that you don't love me? <laughs> what I find amazing about this is despite their cold and faithless hearts, the God of the universe intervenes himself into human history. This morning, my wife and I were up early like we are every Sunday morning out and we were walking by 5.30 and it was still pitch black. It was dark. And one of the things as we were walking, I'd looked up, man, the sky was bright this morning at 5.30. I mean, the stars, you could see them clearly. You could see the, the little dipper and the moon. It was only like a quarter of a moon, but that bright sliver. And I was thinking about the fact that God has loved me and God does love me and God will love me. And I'm just praying and I'm looking up to the heavens and I'm seeing the stars and I'm just getting overwhelmed with the vastness and the hugeness of who, who God is. And in spite of our coldness, in spite of our faithlessness, in spite of our sinness, in spite of our doubting, the God of the universe loved us enough to interject himself and go to a man by the name of Malachi and say, go tell my people, I have loved them. Get amazed by God and his love. He's a good God. And by the way, there's over 1,000 years of proof of this statement. He backs it up. I mean, you can go all the way back to Abraham. Abraham was just a man. There was nothing special or great about him. He wasn't rich. He wasn't royalty. He was just an ordinary man that we would have never known about if it was not for God's love. And God chose him out of all the people in this world. And he made an everlasting covenant with him. And he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation among whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. Because God loves. 
in God's love, he led his nation of his children of Israel out of Egypt and out of slavery and bondage. And he led them through the wilderness and he parted the Red Sea and he fed them with manna every single day and he cared for them and provided for them. And eventually he led them through the Jordan River and into the promised land and he knocked down the walls of Jericho and he gave them a land that flows with milk and honey. Make no mistake about it. God has loved the nation of Israel and he proved it. You know, God forgave the nation of Israel in love time after time after time. Have any of you experienced God's forgiving love time after time after time? I'll raise my hand and testify to that. One of my favorite stories is, man, it's early on in their relationship and God had done all the 10 plagues and he'd parted the Red Sea and he descends. God's physical presence comes down in front of all the people. He descends on Mount Sinai and thunderings and lightnings and the earthquakes and the people fall on their faces dead. And Moses goes up into the mountain and he receives the 10 commandments directly from the hand of the Lord. God gives him the law and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And in that 40 days, what did the children of Israel do? They rebel. We don't know what happened to Moses. I mean, 40 days is a long time, but are you kidding me? The Red Sea, the 10 plagues, I mean, they, they made a golden calf and they started worshiping idols and they wanted somebody to take them back into Egypt. And Moses comes down and he slams the tablets when he sees the idolatry. And eventually God calls him back up into the mountain and God shows himself to Moses. And you know the very first thing he says to Moses? The Lord the Lord gracious and merciful, forgiving iniquity to thousands and upon generations. Are you thankful for God's mercy and God's grace? How many of you know God has loved you because he has forgiven you time and time again? Oh, there's a thousand years of proof to this statement in love. He delivered them back into the promised land. They should have been wiped off the face of the earth, but they're back in their promised land. They're back in the city of Jerusalem. The walls had been rebuilt. The temple had been rebuilt. God had given them incredible promises that someday the glory of the Lord in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, would fill that temple. God was not done with his people, even though it felt like he was not there. He was there. God has loved them. So here's the practical application. See God loves. See God's love. See God's love. That's the practical application right there. Smile. God loves you. I love the title of this. I'm bringing that back up again because I want you to understand that this is not a light or trivial statement. Smile, God. It can feel light and trivial. And there's a lot of people that, that maybe don't fully understand all of the weight. But when you say, God has loved you, God does love me. There's a whole lot of history that backs a statement like that up. It's serious. It's weighty. That statement enough, it's heavy enough to change every single thing about your life. I believe with all my heart that God loves you. He loves me. And he hates sin. And he hates the ugly consequences of sin. I know that there's people in here that have experienced horrific things in their lives. Things that no human being should ever have to go through. Things that no human being should ever have to experience. There's people that have experienced abuse, physical, sexual, emotional. There's people that have experienced tragic loss out of nowhere. It's just totally blindsided you and turned your world upside down. There's people who've gone through sickness and pain, all kinds of things. Can I tell you, God hates sin, He hates the ugly consequences of sin. One of my favorite passages of scripture to share at funerals, I should share it at almost every funeral, is in John chapter 11. It's the story where Jesus raises Lazarus back from the grave. And in that story, they send word to to Jesus that his friend Lazarus is sick, and Jesus doesn't come right away. And he waits, and he finally shows up four days after Lazarus had been dead. And he shows up, and Lazarus' sisters, Jesus' close friends, Mary and Martha, they come, and they said, if only you had been here, Lazarus would still be alive. And Jesus says, show me where he's laid. And they take him to the grave. And I'm sure that there's some other friends and family members and people from the village that follow Jesus to the place where Lazarus laid. And in John chapter 11, there's verse 35. It's the shortest verse in the entire Bible. It's got two very profound words. Jesus wept. I believe with all my heart, he looked at Mary and Martha and he he sees the grief. He sees their pain. He sees their suffering and their tears. 
And he's moved with compassion. And he hates that they're suffering. And he hates that they're going through it. And he sees all of the ugly consequences of sin and death and the pain that it causes. But you know what's even better than the fact that Jesus wept? Two verses earlier in verse 33, it says that he groaned in his spirit. And that word groaned isn't just like, oh, I hate this. That word groaning has to do with an intense, fiery anger. He groaned in his spirit. He looked at sin and he looked at death and he looked at all of its consequences and he says, I hate this sin. I hate death. I I hate that life is this way. It's not what I intended it to be. And you know what he did? He did something about it. He stood at that grave and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And guess what happened to Lazarus? A man dead four days comes up out of that grave and he is alive. And God declared war on sin, hell, death, and the grave. And you know what happened just a few weeks later, a few days later, he marches into Jerusalem and he offers himself up as a sacrifice for sin. And he hangs on a cross and he dies. The son of God, the creator of heaven and earth died. And they laid him in a cold, dark tomb. And it was that way for three days. And I believe with all my heart, all of earth held its breath. Nobody was moving at the thought of what has happened to the creator of the universe. But on that third day, can I tell you what happened? He came up out of that grave and he's alive and he destroyed sin and he destroyed death and he defeated it once and for all. And can I tell you that in your pain and in your suffering, God has loved you. And he did something about you're suffering. And he did something about sin. And he did something about death. And he did something about all of the evil in this world. He died and he paid so that we could have life and breath and everlasting life in him. Can I tell you this morning, God has loved you. How many of you, man, that, it's a sobering. When we stop and think about the sacrifice, it's, it's sobering, isn't it? But man, when you realize the reality, it's smile. God has loved you, and he died so that you could have a relationship with him. So God has loved you. Secondly, this morning, God does love you. Smile, God does love you. Look at verses 2 and 3. The Bible says in verse 2, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? And then God's going to give some proof of his love. He's going to back it up with a very, very incredible statement. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob, and then at the beginning of verse 3, and I hated Esau. That's a pretty profound and honestly shocking statement. And when you come across statements like this, I have spent a whole lot of time this week just studying and meditating and just breaking that down. Esau have I hated, Jacob have I loved. Now, let me give you a quick history lesson, okay? Who were the founding fathers of the nation of Israel? That starts with Abraham, and then who's next? Isaac, and then who's next? Jacob. Now, Abraham makes sense because there was no nation of Israel until God came and chose Abraham and said, hey, you're going to be the father of this great nation. So he makes sense. Well, then Isaac also makes sense because God promised Abraham and Sarah Sarah was part of that promise as well. He promised them a son and a seed, and Isaac was the only son that Abraham and Sarah had. Abraham had some other sons, but Isaac was the only son that Abraham and Sarah had, and so it makes sense that Isaac would be the chosen seed. But then you get to Isaac's sons. He had two, Jacob and Esau. They're brothers. Not only are they brothers, they're twins. I mean, you want to talk about a close relationship. They're twins. And not only are they twins... But Esau is older than Jacob. Jacob's the younger son. And before they're even born, before either one of them had any chance to earn God's favor or lose God's favor, he chose Jacob before Esau was even born. And everything about that scenario says that Esau should have been the one that was chosen and should have been the one that was favored by God. So let's think about this for a little bit. God hated Esau? Did God really hate Esau? By choosing Jacob and not Esau, he hated Esau in a particular way, okay? Let me, let me explain it like this. I have three sons, okay? I have Stuart, my oldest. I have Shepard, my middle. I have Saban, my youngest. And let's just pretend for a minute that I am a multi-billionaire, man. I'm richer than Elon Musk, all right? I'm, close, I'm closing in on a trillion dollars, 
and all of the wealth and all of the goods that I have, man, I'm only going to pass it on to one of my sons. And I'm not going to give it to my older son. And I'm not going to give it to my younger son because we all know who are the ones that are really rejected in this world today. It's the middle child, right? Where are my middle children? I'm an oldest child, but I still see you. And I hear your pain, but I could care less. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just joking about that. My middle son, Shepard, he always feels like he gets ripped off in life sometimes. Just, we just joke around about that all the time. But today, Shepard, you get all of my billions and all of my trillions. They all go to him. Man, he's a pretty lucky guy, isn't he? Now, would it shock you if Saban and Stuart both came to me and said, why does dad hate me? Like, you hate me. How could you give all of it to him and none of it to me? I mean, how many of you agree that would be a real human reaction? I mean, absolutely, that, that's, God hated Esau in a particular way by choosing to give all of the covenant, the, making Jacob the heir of promise, which came with God's everlasting covenant of love and faithfulness that was not dependent on Jacob or Abraham or Isaac's behavior because they were all sinners just like you and I are. And to put all of that on Jacob and for Esau to miss that out. Now, I want you to understand that God choosing Esau, I mean, Jacob over Esau here in this passage, it has nothing to do with God's general blessings. Okay? Esau was a blessed man. By the way, God causes the sun to shine on the just and on the unjust. God, there is a general love of God for all mankind. Make no mistake about it. God loves people. He loves all of us. There's a general love that's out there. And it had nothing to do with God's general blessings because if you go back and read those stories, you'll find out that God made a great nation out of Esau. And when Jacob came back after, man, they had a lot of fights. I don't have time to go into that. But Jacob was scared to death to go meet his brother after 20 some years. He thought he was going to kill him. And he starts sending him all of these like, you could call them bribes or whatever to like pay him off or to show that he's sorry for what he had done. And Esau sends it all back and says, I have enough. God had been good to him in a general way, okay, in a general sense. It had nothing to do with his eternal destiny. I don't personally believe that Esau had no choice in the matter. I don't believe that there's going to be any guiltless people in hell. I believe with all my heart that if Esau is in hell, it's because of his own sin and his own rejection of God. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that he despised his birthright. Not in Hebrews chapter 11, 12, I believe it is. That he despised his birthright. And he got, he sought after it with repentance, but it wasn't a sincere and genuine repentance. He didn't really care about the birthright, about being God's chosen seed. Maybe he just cared about the riches and the blessings that he thought he was going to miss out on. So this has nothing to do with his eternal destiny. I believe with all my heart that he could have got on board with God's plan and on board with what God was doing and say, okay, Jacob's the chosen seed. He's the promised heir. I still want a part of that and I'll go along with what you're doing and I'll submit to that. But I don't, I don't know if that ever happened or not and I don't see that happening as you go throughout the story. So in that particular way, God hated Esau. But then you come here to Matthew, Malachi chapter 3. And we're talking about God does love us, okay? We're not talking about the past anymore. So let's fast forward to the present. God hated Esau. By the time of Malachi, the nation of Edom had been conquered and its people driven out. Look what he says at the end of verse 3. He says, And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Okay, so by the time Malachi's on the scene, he's telling God's people. He's telling the seed of Jacob, okay, Israel. Look at Edom. Look at Jacob's brother. He's destroyed. He's, he's wiped out. Their cities have become ghost towns, populated only by the dragons of the, the wilderness, jackals, coyotes, wolves. It was so decimated. It was so desolate that nobody was even inhabiting their cities and their towns and where they lived because of the wrath of God that had been poured out. And by the way, can I tell you, Unless you sit here and you begin to question God's hatred, God's justness, God's righteousness, Edom absolutely deserved the punishment that they got. About 100 years earlier, a little bit more than that, when, when the Babylonians went in and they conquered um, the nation of Israel, guess what the Edomites did? Guess what Esau's descendants did? 
Oh, they cheered it on. They were excited about it. And they went in and they exploited the children of Israel when they were at their worst. They went in and they killed their babies and they robbed their city and they did all kinds of horrible atrocities against the nation of Israel. And you know what God's telling his children? Wherein hast thou loved us? Open up your eyes and look. Edom is destroyed. You know, the the sin that they did against you, the crimes that they committed against you, I am just and I am righteous and people will not get away with their wickedness and I did something about it and they're destroyed forever. Look at verse four. He says, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Anybody that survived, they're like, we're going to go back and rebuild. And God says, whatever you rebuild, I'm going to destroy. And the only thing that you're going to be remembered for is your wickedness. And that the Lord hath indignation against you forever. And by the way, that ought to make every single one of us in here rejoice and give all the glory and praise to God because of all the injustice. You ever get mad at the injustice in the world? You ever wonder why God allows certain things to happen and he doesn't? It's for a time. And one day God will judge, and he will be righteous, and he will be just. And these people were wicked, and they had rejected God, and they got the punishment that they deserved. And so God's telling his people, hey, I do love you. Here you are. You're back in the promised land. I still have big plans for you. But Edom, they're no more. That's what it looks like to be rejected by God. That's what it looks like to not have God's love and favor on your life. It looks like eternal wrath and eternal destiny forever separated from God. And in real life, you can fast forward into a place called hell. I believe the picture here of Jacob and Esau is a whole lot bigger than just the two brothers. It's a parable. You either are a part of God's covenant love or you're not. And that leads me to the real troubling part of that verse. Spent a lot of time talking about the fact that God hated Esau. But can I tell you that God loved Jacob? The real trouble, there's a story a while, a while back about a, a lady that came up to Charles Spurgeon. He was a famous preacher in the 1800s, and she was upset, and she's just like, I just I can't believe in God because it says in the Bible that he hated Esau, and I'm troubled by this. And he says, you know what troubles me is the fact that God loved Jacob. Think about that for a second. We, de- we all deserve Esau's fate in the matter. We're sinners. Jacob wasn't any better of a man than Esau. Jacob was a deceiver. He was a supplanter. I mean, he did a lot of messed up stuff. The nation of Israel, they had failed time after time after time. They didn't deserve God's love. And yet here they are under God's divine favor and under God's divine love because that's how good and how great God is. Hey, why use a powerful illustration like this? I- between love and hate. Well, I believe this. Like, like light in opposition to darkness, love takes on special significance only when it is restricted. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Melanie, I want you to turn off all the lights in here. Make it go completely dark. We're getting there. Maybe we're going to get there. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's as dark as we're going to get. Okay. How many of you, who, oh, I can still see you. Who all was here during Hurricane Ivan? How many of you remember like weeks and weeks without power? Who remembers those days? There we go. Now we're talking. Okay. Just imagine if like there was no light whatsoever. And maybe if any of you have gone through a long power outage and you know what it's like to live in darkness, I mean, it starts getting old and it starts getting depressing. Um, have any of you ever been in the middle of a cave and experienced what they call cave darkness? Raise your hand if you had. I can't see you, okay? <laughs> and that's the point, man. When you're in the center of a cave, cave dark, I, I forget how it is, but you will go blind extremely fast because your eyes will be looking for light. And I think in like it's a matter of hours or whatever, you can start having permanent eye damage and different things like that. Imagine just always being in darkness. You know, I was just telling you a minute ago that, that Jacob and Esau, it's a parable between God's love and God's hate. It's, it's kind of a parable of the bigger picture. You're either part of God's covenant community or you're not. And if you're not, you're living in darkness. And if you're not, one day when you die and you stand before God, you're going to experience eternal separation from God forever. 
I mean, that's depressing. But go ahead and turn the lights back on. Isn't that amazing? The difference? I mean, do you understand what we're talking about? Love, hate, the reason why God uses parables like this, the reason why God uses illustrations like this is to cause us to wake up and realize, I don't want nothing to do with the darkness. I don't want to be separated from God. I don't want to be left out. I don't want to miss God's covenant of love. I don't want to miss his faithfulness and his forgiveness. And even though I don't deserve it, and even though I could never do anything to earn it, his love is free and his love is unconditional and his love is awesome and I want it. And here's the reality. Here's the practical application. Choose God's love. Choose God's love. Hey, you doubt God's love because of some unmet expectations and maybe some personal disappointments in your life. And yet here you are today and here through God's word, he's interjected himself into your life and into your human history. And the Bible says, God has loved you and God does love you. And he did something on the cross so that you can know him and you can experience him. Choose God's love. Hey, when we think of, when we, when we talk about God choosing. This is what I believe. I believe that God chooses people to heaven and not to hell. Okay, and when we think of choosing, we think of it as in looking back. Have you ever just got overwhelmed by your salvation and you just make a statement like, I cannot believe God chose me? You ever been there before? Man, I challenge you, if you haven't been there in a long time, get there today before this message is over. And you start thinking about your sin You start thinking about our problems and our faults and our failures. And you start thinking about God's faithfulness and God's mercy and God's great love that went to a cross. Man, every day of our lives, we ought to get up and we ought to just be humbled and amazed like, I can't believe I'm your child. I can't believe I'm forgiven. I can't believe I'm saved. I can't believe I'm a part of an awesome church like this. I I can't believe that we get to go and worship and sing songs about how holy God is. And forever and ever, we're going to be able to lift praise. And we're going to be able to sing praises to God. I can't believe that God chose me. When we think of God's choosing, we 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 don't need to think about it as in looking forward. I wonder if I'm chosen. Or I wonder if that person is chosen or not chosen. Can I tell you, for God so loved the, that he gave his only begotten son. And I believe that the Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And here's the last thing I want to say. The choice is yours. I believe that with all my heart. If you feel like you want to be a part of God's love, God's calling you. God's chosen you. And by the way, you can't get mad at God for rejecting you if you reject him. You can't say God didn't choose me if that's your posture and your heart's attitude towards him. You can't get upset at him for not choosing you if you don't choose him. And so I say this morning, the choice is yours. How do you know whether you're chosen or not? Hey, if you feel God's love pulling you towards him, then respond to it and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because he loves you and he loved you before the foundation of the world and he died for you on the cross and he wants to save you from your sins and give you a relationship and new life with him. So choose God's love. So God has loved you. God does love you. And last, and we're done. God will love you. Smile. God will love you. Look at verse five. I love this. He says this. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. You know what he's telling them? They're saying, how have you loved us? Wherein is your love towards us? I have loved you, and your eyes will see it. Your eyes will see. Your doubts of God's love will be erased. The Lord will be magnified from the borders of Israel. All the world will see God's power and his faithfulness and his love. And he's going to be seen from the borders of Israel, and he's going to be seen in your life. And you know what God's telling us? Take the scales off of our eyes. See that not only has he loved you, not only does he love you, he will love you forever. So open your eyes and see. And here's the last practical application and we're done. Enjoy God's love. Enjoy God's love. Smile. God loves you. And I love the extra statement that goes with it. And after all that we've put him through, that's saying something. How many of you agree with that right there? After all we have put him through, that's saying something. Here's my challenge to you this morning. 
Stop focusing on what you don't have and see what you do have. When we're talking about enjoying God's love, stop focusing on what you don't have and see what you do have. Yes, the children of Israel, they're looking there and they're looking at their past. And they're looking at, man, I wish we were living in Solomon's temple. And I wish the glory and the presence of the Lord was just as bright and as shiny as what it was then. And I wish we were prosperous. And I wish we were comfortable. And why were they wishing for those things? They weren't really interested in God. They weren't really interested in his love. They were interested in the benefits and the blessings that God could pour out on their lives. You know what God wants us to be interested in? Him. And if they would have just opened their eyes, even in their brokenness, even in the shell of what their life should have been or what they thought it could have been, oh, you know what they're going to see? They're going to see God's love, and they're going to see God's mercy, and they're going to see God's grace. You know what I say to all of us this morning, those of you in here that may be faced with some financial difficulties? My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Don't focus on what you do. Don't have focus on what you do have. You have a relationship with God and with Jesus. Hey, those of you that are going through loss, going through just a personal disappointment, maybe battling sickness and fighting those different things, you know what the Bible says? That he'll work all things together for good to them who love God. He says, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. I could sit up here and I could go through promise after promise after promise for the next several minutes as we close out our service. All I want to tell you this morning is enjoy God's love. Man, when we get overwhelmed by the fact that he has loved us and he does love us and he will love us, all of that's there to release the pressure, the anxiety, the doubt, the fear, the pain, and just to cause us to say, God, I may not have anything by this world's standards, but I got something greater and bigger and better and I have you. And you know when that starts happening? The Lord's going to be magnified from your borders. The Lord's going to be magnified in your life. And the whole world will see his love and his faithfulness and his power and in his strength. If we want to live a life of thanks living, (laughs) it starts by just being amazed that God loves us. Smile. God loves you this morning. And he'll love you tomorrow morning. He loved you yesterday morning. He's always going to love you. And because of that, everything is going to be okay.